Okay, hello. Um, so, um, so first of all, uh, um, today actually is a new moon, <laughs> and it has has several consequences. Um, uh, one is that uh, presumably Thursday will be the first day of the Muslim month of Shawwal, so uh, tomorrow night will be the beginning of Eid al-Fitr, so uh, Eid Mubarak to those who are celebrating that. Um, it also means that Monday is the sixth day of the ancient Athenian month of Thargelion, which uh, means it will be Socrates' 2,488th birthday. <laughs> um, and finally, it means that the Jewish holiday of Shavuot will be Monday and Tuesday of next week. Um, and uh, that's the main reason I'm announcing it to you, because as it says on the syllabus, um, uh, the lecture... There'll be no lecture a week from today, so Thursday will be normal. There'll be no, no lecture a week from today. Instead, I'll be giving it on Wednesday at this time. Um, so if you can come at that time to see the live lecture, that would be great. If not, I'll record it as usual, and you can watch it that way. Um, so... Uh, Secondly, I wanted to discuss the second writing assignment. Uh, let's see. Sorry, technical difficulties. There we go. This is the first writing, the second writing assignment. Oh, this is the first writing assignment. This is the second writing assignment. All right. Um, so the instructions are pretty simple, uh, although I I know they can be hard to understand. That's why I'm going to go through it. Um, um, like the last, like the first writing assignment, it's basically just like an exercise. It's an exercise in, they're both kind of exercises in textual interpretation. Um, although, well, this one, first one is really about textual interpretation. This one tends more towards understanding the structure of Barclay's arguments, I guess I would say. In, in any case, um, so it has... Um, So it begins with finding something that's apparently undeniable, like who would deny that? And it can be either, it can be undeniable because it's part of common sense, um, like I have two hands, or it can be undeniable because it's, uh, um, it's clear from mathematics or um, from physics natural science. So, um, you know, like the square of the two sides equals the square of the hypotenuse or whatever, something like that. 
So you're supposed to find something like that and then explain briefly why, even though this is something you would think no one denies, would deny, it seems like Barclay does deny it. So, so that's kind of like an objection, right? That, that first part is raising an objection against Barclay. Here's this thing that seems undeniable, but here's why it looks like you, Barclay, are denying it. And then the second part is to answer the objection on Barclay's behalf. So the same objection he just raised, now you're going to explain how Barclay would respond to it. Um, and there's two parts to the response. First, he says, um, well, if you understand that statement that you just said was undeniable correctly, then I agree with it. I don't deny it. But then he's also going to say, but there's another way of understanding it, which is like the bad philosophical way of understanding it. And in that way of understanding it, yes, indeed, I do deny it, but I don't think um, on that understanding it has anything to do with common sense or sound mathematics or sound natural science. It's just bad philosophy. And in fact, not only is it not true, it's absurd. Right, so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that he says to all kinds of stuff. He responds in those two parts. Um, um, if you understand what I'm asking you to do, it shouldn't be that hard. But I think maybe it's hard to understand what I'm asking you to do. So let me... Um, yeah, there's nothing else here that I... It's any different from the last assignment that I need to talk about. So let me just pause and see if there are questions about that. So someone said, I don't know at what point you said this, something that Barclay is saying. But it's, so the assignment is about something that Barclay is, seems to be denying, right? So like there's a table in front of me, you know, um, as I'm talking to you, there's a table in front of me. That seems like common sense, undeniable. In, in that case, it's because of common sense, right? So, but it seems like Barclay denies it because a table is like um, a body, a material thing, and Barclay denies that there are any material things, including that table. So it seems like Barclay denies it, even though it would appear undeniable, right? Like I would have to be, something would have to be wrong with me for me to walk up to a table and say, oh, there's no table there. And yet it seems like that's what Barclay is saying. So Barclay's going to respond and say, well, actually, um, you know, the real common sense way of, underst of understanding what it means to say there's a table in front of me, Barclay is going to say, I don't deny that at all. The table that I see is right there for sure. The thing that's the immediate object of the mind in my perception, that table is there. I'm not denying that, but I am denying something else. Something that someone like Locke thinks you need to add to that. That thing that I'm seeing is not the same as what's immediately present in my mind, but it's something outside my mind that's not dependent on any mind that's causing it. Right? So that Barclay is going to say, oh, well, if you understand it that way, I don't think, he's going to say, I don't think that's common sense. I think that's weird philosophy. And also, I think it's absurd. So does that example make it clear how the, what the assignment is? Right, the two parts are both Barclay's position. But you're not, the reason I say this is getting somewhat away from just from pure textual analysis, you're not necessarily quoting Barclay.
to make this argument. You're just trying to, uh, like, you know, speak on Barclay's behalf. This is what Barclay would say. So, I mean, it has to be, you know, like, obviously that has to be based on the Barclay that we read. You're not just supposed to guess what Barclay would say from the fact that his name was Barclay or something. But, right, but it's... Um, but it's not necessarily words that Barclay himself said because he didn't consider this particular example that you're bringing. Okay, like I said, it's, I, I think it shouldn't be... If it's seeming like it's incredibly hard, then, I mean, I guess, you know, what is hard about it? I mean, yeah, it does, it requires you to think like Barclay a little bit. Um, and, and it requires you to, you know, to think like Barclay beyond just being able to quote Barclay, but thinking, so what would Barclay actually say about this? That's, that's, that's why, that's the somewhat difficult part. Um, okay, so if there are no questions, more questions about that, I'll go on and start talking about Hume. So, let me just want to erase it. Oh, this tower is still up with me. Um, so David Hume and his dates are 1711 to 1776. Um, and let's see, what can I tell you about him? Uh, he spent, he was, he was Scottish. He spent most of his life in Scotland, although he did also spend some time in England and France. Um, he, uh, was widely believed to be an atheist. Now, I mean, he didn't say I'm an atheist. In fact, he said, I'm not an atheist, but, uh, but I think especially when we read the dialogues concerning natural religion at the end of the quarter, um, you'll see, uh, some of the reasons why uh, people might have thought that about him. Um, anyway, this fact that he was supposed to be an atheist uh, caused him trouble. He was not uh, able to get an appointed uh, professor. That is, he tried to get appointed a professor at either at Edinburgh or Glasgow, and uh, he and he was turned down from both because of this. Um, although he did manage to get hired as a librarian by the University, I guess, of Edinburgh. So that helped him out. Um, it also may have caused some misinterpretation of his work later on. Um, so he's very widely read and influential. Um, but his followers in Scotland... I mean, that is not followers, but his successors in Scotland, the continuation of Scottish, Scottish philosophy, first of all, through Thomas Reed. Um, they certainly all read Hume, but they kind of fell all over themselves trying to expose all his blunders because they were um, um, all good, respectable religious people, and they wanted to make sure it was clear that this atheist really got things wrong. <laughs> um, at least that's my understanding of part of what happens there. Um, on the other hand, Kant had enormous respect for Hume. Um, so, uh, so his most uh, important influence, and remember, like at the beginning of the course, when I talked how the whole about how the whole division between empiricists 
and rationalists is basically Kant looking back at his predecessors and Kant himself being so influential that that's the way we still look back at his predecessors. So, um, so among them, Kant counted Hume as perhaps the most brilliant one. Um, uh, I mean, Kant regarded Hume's conclusions as not so much the atheist one, oh, that's complicated, but his conclusions about what we're going to be talking about today, beginning today, causality and things like that as a scandal to philosophy that had to be overcome. But he thought that, you know, no one other than Hume had raised the problem in such clarity that he had, that he himself, Kant, had to solve. Um, okay, so as far as the things we're going to be reading, so, um, so the thing we're reading second was actually, we're reading a small part of, really, second, um, is the thing that, Hume published first, the, tr the Treatise of Human Nature, 1739, so he was 28 <laughs> when he published the Treatise of Human Nature. Um, uh, and as he wrote about it later on, uh, it he said it quote unquote fell stillborn from the press, meaning like no one bought it. <laughs> so that was kind of disappointing to him. And he spent uh, several years after that, um, among other things, trying to figure out how to reformulate this so that it would be more popular. Um, and the first result of that was um, inquiry concerning, right? Concerning the human understanding. So that was published in 1748, almost 10 years later. Um, and I guess I should say the treatise of human nature has three main parts. The first part is about the understanding. The second part is about the passions. And the third part is about the will. Um, so uh, when he redid his philosophy later, he split it up into three separate little books. The first one, The Anchory Concerning Human Understanding, corresponds to the first part of the treatise. It's sometimes called The First Anchory. Then he published another one called The Anchory Concerning the Principles of Morals, which corresponds to the third part of the treatise. And then um, even later he published something called Dissertation on the Passions, which is basically like it's, it's really just kind of a um, shorter version of the second book of the treatise. He just kind of cut out the text mostly. Although I, d I did just read it with a grad student and I noticed that there are some interesting changes there. It's not all just shorter, but in any case, um, uh, so in some iterations of this course that we read um, the second inquiry in addition to the first inquiry, um, but this year, as in some other years when I've taught the course, I'm ending instead with the dialogues concerning natural religion. And that was published posthumously in 1779. Right? It was published posthumously. Presumably, Hume didn't want to publish this in his lifetime because the content was scandalous. Um, um, okay, so why are we reading part of this and part of this? This, I think, I mean, 
I would love to read the second inquiry and the dialogue concerning natural religion, dialogues concerning natural religions. That's why I keep switching back and forth between them. The second inquiry, you know, connects with the discussion of ethics that we saw, especially in Locke. Um, and, you know, takes up the theme of public utility and the other stuff from there. Um, whereas the dialogues concerning natural religion take up the theme of proof of the existence of God uh, and, um, and things related to that. I mean, those really both go together in Locke. So it would be nice to read both of them in Hume, but there isn't time in the corridor. So, um, but... As, as for these, um, so the reason we're reading part of this and part of this, well, so Hume obviously thought that the later versions were better or at least more readable, but I, it seems like he changed his mind about things in between the first book of the treatise and the first inquiry. It's hard to tell for sure, though, because the first inquiry is so much shorter <laughs> than the first book of the treatise. So... Um, um, but in any case, obviously he thought the second version was better in some way, or he wouldn't have published a second version. Um, since then, a lot of people have disagreed and thought, and, and by the way, I should say, and he also asked uh, explicitly that um, his that future critics of his work limit themselves to considering the later version and not consider the, you know, the treatise that he published when he was so young. However, since then, a lot of people have disagreed and thought that the treatise was better in various respects. I'm not sure if I think that or not, but I do think that, um, first of all, the treatise treat treats some topics in detail that don't get a detailed treatment in the inquiry. And second of all, it contains some radical arguments that are not found in the, in the inquiry. So, I mean, especially as far as that second point goes, of course, it, can, it may be that Hume didn't repeat those radical arguments in the, in the inquiry because he didn't think they were right. But they're still really interesting, right or not. So that's why we're going to be reading them from the treatise. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, like the basic framework of his system is shorter and perhaps he's right, more readable in the inquiry. So that's why we're reading them in, in the opposite of chronological order, right? And starting with the basic framework from the first inquiry and then going to some detailed arguments from the treatise. Um, but I should probably mention one more thing about him, which is that Hume in his own lifetime was most famous for his history of England, which published in, I think, seven volumes, I didn't write down here, but 17, between 1754 and 61. History of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688. So, um, um, which I actually have read or I listened to the audiobook of it in the car <laughs> over like the course of a year or so. Um, and it's definitely very interesting and very uh, worth reading. Um, uh, but I mentioned it here, I guess, especially because it's important to keep in mind throughout the arguments we're going to be talking about that Hume himself was a historian who engaged in all this careful reasoning about matters of fact to try to figure out what actually happened and what didn't. Um, so whatever arguments he makes brings against that kind of reasoning, the conclusion is not going to be that you shouldn't do it because he spent most of his time doing it. <laughs> okay, um, are there questions about human general before I go into the text of the inquiry? Okay. Um, 
All right, so the reading for today was sections one through four of the inquiry. Um, I'm going to say almost nothing about section one. Um, it's actually really interesting. It has important stuff in it, but I learned in previous years that if I spent time talking about section one, I would never get to sections two through four, which are even more important. So um, the only thing I want to say about section one for now is um, just to note for future reference, Hume thinks Hume uh, is in a way kind of apologizing for writing a type of philosophy which is abstruse and contains difficult arguments um, and perhaps reaches uncomfortable conclusions as well. Um, and But his apology is not... Um, um, He doesn't completely absolve himself of the charges, I guess I would say. He admits that he, he thinks that there are potential benefits, but he seems to admit that there are potential dangers to the type of philosophy that he's doing here, both for himself and for society. Um, so that issue will come up later, I think, especially uh, at the end of the reading from the treatise and in the dialogues. Um, uh, and, and I guess all I'll say about it for now is, you know, the balance apparently between those potential benefits and those potential dangers, um, um, has to be, uh, or it may depend on knowing when to stop arguing. I think that's very important to you. Um, so I guess, like I said, you'll see more what I mean about that later. Okay, so um, the main topics that I do want to discuss today um, are, first of all, uh, ideas and impressions. This is basically sections one and two. I mean, sorry, two and three. And then the second one is skepticism about matters of fact. which is basically section four. So ideas and impressions. So first of all, here is a quote from section one, even though I'm not going to be talking about section one. Here's a quote from section one. Um, page one. Um, Um, okay, so here he's talking about what the abstruse or difficult philosophers, including him, do. And what they do is they regard human nature as a subject of speculation and with a narrow scrutiny examine it in order to find those principles which regulate our understanding, excite our sentiments, and make us approve or blame any particular object. Those are the three parts of the treatise that I mentioned before and, the, and the, that correspond to the two inquiries and the dissertation on the passions, right? The principles that regulate our understanding, that's what this book is about. Excite our sentiments, that's what the dissertation on the passions is about. And make us approve or blame any particular object, that's what the inquiry on the principles of morals is about. 
So um, that's what he's going to be talking about. And therefore, basically, the subject matter here is the same as what Locke and Berkeley were talking about. Right? It's the contents of the mind and the principles by which we um, reach conclusions, um, uh, you know, desire one thing rather than another, so on and so forth. Um, however, and this is, this is confusing, but there's no avoiding it. Hume's terminology differs from the ter from Locke and Berkeley's terminology. So, um, so, um, basically what Locke and Berkeley call ideas, Hume calls perceptions, perceptions of the mind. This is, right, like I said, this is more or less what Locke and Berkeley call ideas. But then he divides them into two parts. And one he calls impressions. And the other he calls ideas. Right, so he's using idea only for a subpart of what they call ideas. And he's calling the other things they call ideas impressions. Um, and roughly speaking, impressions are what um, what Berkeley calls uh, well, what Locke and Berkeley call ideas of sense, plus. Uh, some passions and things like that, which Locke and Berkeley probably also think are like ideas of sense, although that's a little bit more complicated. Right, so here go all kinds of sensations and passions when you actually feel the passion. So white, when I see white, is an impression. Anger, when I feel anger, is an impression. Whereas ideas are um, what Locke or Berkeley call ideas of the imagination or something like that. So it's like white when I remember or imagine white. Or anger when I remember or imagine anger, but I'm not feeling it now. Those would be ideas. So, I mean, it's not too hard to keep track of this difference if you focus, but if you don't focus, it can trip you up when you're trying to compare them with each other because both Hume, I mean, all three of them use the term idea constantly, but Hume doesn't mean exactly the same thing um, as they do. I guess, I mean, sometimes Barclay does call these things mere ideas or ideas more narrowly speaking or something like that. And I guess it's that usage that Hume is following. Okay, so anyway, um, these two things are supposed to differ from each other in at least two important ways. Number one they differ from each other in what Hume calls force or vivacity. The impressions are strong or vivid, forceful, something like that, whereas the ideas are fainter. So, I mean, this is the same thing that Berkeley said. Um, and that Locke although he doesn't emphasize it as much, I think also agrees with that ideas of sense are somehow stronger than mere ideas of imagination. Now, I mean, stronger in what way? I mean, it's not like, at least this is not the way he's thinking about it. It's not like the white I remember is less white than the white I see. Like it's kind of gray or something. <laughs> It's exactly as white. It's just the whole thing's not as strong somehow. 
Um, and similarly, the anger, I remember. This maybe is less obvious. I mean, even the first one isn't obvious, but this they made is less obvious that even the, the anger I remember or imagine, I'm not remembering or imagining being less angry than I actually was or would be. But nevertheless, this anger, which is just as strong, doesn't affect me as, strong or as strongly as the real anger would. So that's one difference between impressions and ideas. And the other difference, which Hume emphasizes the most, is that before every idea, there's an impression of which the idea is, is a kind of copy. This, this is where Hume's empiricism is centered, right? This is his description of empiricism, basically. That, um, like, I can't have an idea of white, this kind of fainter version of white, the perception of white, unless I first had an impression of white. I can't have the idea of anger unless I first had the impression of anger. So, um, that claim, of course, is the same as the same claim that Locke made, uh, Ray, that the mind can't create. I mean, that is, it's a different way of putting the same thing that Locke is claiming, I think, that the mind can't form new simple ideas. It can put together copies of ideas that it's already got through sense or reflection. Um, so, um, why should we believe that? I mean, why should we believe that impressions are always stronger or more vivid and ideas are always fainter? It seems like, oh, even this isn't 100% clear. Sometimes it seems like it might be the other way around. But mostly it seems like that's the definition of impressions, right? So, like, of course they're stronger or more vivid. That's what we're talking about here. Our stronger or more vivid perceptions are called our impressions. Um, but then it doesn't follow from that definition that the ideas, which are not as strong, have to come after the impressions and be copies of them. So um, why should we think that? Um, so it kind of seems like this is empirical. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, uh, it should follow that it's empirical because Hume thinks that anything that's not true by definition is must, but is still true, must be empirical. Um, so, but here's what he actually says about this principle. Um, this is page. Section 2, page 11. When we analyze our thoughts or ideas, however compounded or sublime, we always find that they resolve themselves into such simple ideas as were copied from a preceding feeling or sentiment. Where feeling or sentiment is here is equivalent to impression, as you can tell from the context. So we always find, right? I mean, and... Uh, that means we know it by experience. And moreover, at least, at least that's what it sounds like it means. And moreover, it sounds like what it really means is so far we have always found. <laughs> right? I mean, who knows if we always will find that. Um... That's one of his arguments 
in, on behalf of this principle. The other argument on the next page is um, that's not where I wanted to be. Yeah. Top of page 12. Secondly, it hap if it happens from a defect of the organ, then a man is not susceptible of any species of sensation. We always find that he has as little susceptible of the corresponding ideas. Um, so, um, again, we always find this is known by experience. Um, and he also adds that people who, even though they don't have a defect of the organ, never happen to have um, had a certain impression, lack the idea of it, right? So, and he mentions, so it's interesting, when Locke talks about this, he usually is talking about an English person who's never tasted pineapple. When Hume talks about it, he uses the example of a Laplander or a Negro who have never tasted wine. That is kind of like the northern or southern barbarians um, um, who have never tasted wine. Um, in any case, I mean, that's definitely worth thinking about, but it doesn't uh, affect the content of the example, which you could do with an Englishman who hasn't tasted pineapple as well. And, the, and so we find... We always find that they didn't, they don't have these ideas. Now, I mean, how do we know that actually? Like, I guess the way you could know that would be by giving the Englishman who has never tasted a pineapple a pineapple. You know, let them taste it, and then say, "Okay, did you have any idea of that before you tasted it?" <laughs> And we've always found so far that they said no. <laughs> or maybe I've always found myself, but that makes it even weirder that the example would be a Negro or a Laplander, right? But, uh, who are presumably not most of his intended audience, if any of it, right? That, but in any case, I've always found myself that when I taste a new thing for the first time, I had no idea of that taste until I tasted it. So... Um, so it seems like this principle of empiricism is it's itself rests on empirical grounds. So far, we've found that uh, ideas must be copies of prior impressions. Um, I guess the thing about people who lack who have a defect in the organ, like to really test that, you would have to have someone who uh, was born blind and then their sight was restored. Um, uh, there have been examples like that, although they aren't... Uh, they're all problematic in certain ways. But anyway, I don't think Hume knew of any, so there are even more. I wonder how he thinks we know that. How do we how do we know that um, you can't tell by asking them, right? As you can't ask someone who's blind from birth, and you say, "Do you have the idea of red?" You can't tell because you know to learn what we mean by red. For that, for sure, they would have to be able to see the same things we do. So we could say that's red, that's red, right? So without that, they might have the idea. Um, they just can't tell us, right? So, I mean, so it's a little weird, but in any case, it does seem like it's supposed to be an empirical conclusion, although um, there's something else that makes me feel strange about that, which is that Hume brings up this one counterexample, and I may come back to this counterexample next time about the missing shade of blue, as it's called, where he says, you know, imagine X, Y, and Z. It's a thought experiment, basically. Imagine someone brought up, you know, and they've seen every shade of blue except one. And then, you know, you show them all the shades of blue with this missing, with this place where there's a shade missing. And you ask them, Do you, can you imagine the shade that would go in between there? And then all of a sudden, instead of an empirical argument, it's like an a priori argument. 
right? Like, well, I think no one would deny that they could. This, this experiment has never been tried, presumably. How do we know <laughs> if they could? So, um, um, anyway, so there's something weird going on there. Um, probably something I don't understand about Hume. Because the alternative, which would be to say that Hume doesn't notice this problem, is really implausible. Ray, right? I mean, this is, he's, you know, using this terminology of we always find, just as he's about to make an argument, criticizing all arguments like that and showing that they're not, they don't demonstrate their conclusions. Um... So anyway, there's there's something and there's something weird going on here, but um, I won't try to explain the missing shade of blue one. That's I think what I really don't understand. I'll somewhat try to explain the other one about how the basis of empiricism can be an empirical conclusion. Um, and, but before that, I want to bring in one other thing, which is very important, which is association of ideas. This is basically section three. So association of ideas. Um, he begins discussing the association of ideas by saying, um, this is page 14 at the beginning of section three. It is evident that there is a principle of connection between the different thoughts or ideas of the mind and that in their appearance to the memory or imagination, they introduce each other with a certain degree of method and regularity. So that's the association of ideas. Ideas don't just come randomly one after another. Rather, depending on what idea I'm having now, that is going to influence what idea will come next. As opposed to impressions, which can just come out of the blue, right? I mean, I think that's the closest Hume gets, at least officially, well, or I think it's Hume's most official version of the closest he gets to Berkeley saying that we're active with respect to our ideas and passive with respect to our impressions. Our ideas follow a certain principle in us um evidently but our impressions don't so um um right and that's where barclay would say they must follow a principle in something else that is the divine will um so anyway our ideas follow each other according to this regular principle of connection um So, however, as he describes this principle of connection, um, at least the way he describes it in section three, there seems to be no distinction between... Um, he seems to not make the distinction that Locke makes between the good, reasonable order of ideas and the bad, uh, unreasonable order of ideas. Right? He's calling them both association of ideas. And, I mean, you can tell that he's, that he's including both here because when he goes on to discuss, like, why it's evident that there's always, a, you know, our ideas always have some connection to each other. He says, uh, well, even in the wildest dream or fancy, there's still some reason that a certain thing comes next. But obviously, you know, there's some reason it comes next, but the reason it comes next is not because it's the next rational step in an argument or something like that, right? The reason it comes next is because it was associated with the previous idea in some way. So, I mean, that's the kind of association that at least if it becomes stuck, Locke calls madness, Um, so Hume is calling both that 
And on the other hand, the way ideas are associated with each other in a rational conversation, he's calling those both association of ideas. Now, we'll see, Hume does make a version of Locke's distinction. We'll see what his version of it is, but we won't see that until the treatise, I think, where he talks about that a little bit. But for now, he's just... Um, it's in a sense easy to convince you that there's always a connection between our ideas because any connection will do. Um, um, however, and this is why I introduced this before I got to that question about how can empiricism be based on an empirical principle. Here again, we seem to find a kind of, um, we seem to find something similar. Um, why should we think that there's always an exception, a connection between ideas? Um, I mean, you might ask, and especially when you get to section seven of the inquiry, it be, might become pressing to ask this, what do we even mean by there's a principle of connection between our ideas? But forgetting that for a moment, why do we think there's always a principle of connection between our ideas? And, you know, when Hume answers that question in basically that first paragraph, of section three, he says, um, uh, well, just think about conversations you've had, dreams you've had, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's always a connection. So again, it's an empirical argument. And when he says going on in section three that the connection always falls under these three headings, namely contiguity in space or time, resemblance, or cause and effect. So those apparently correspond, roughly speaking, to Locke's first three kinds of agreement and disagreement of ideas, right? Identity or diversity, um, relation, and necessary coexistence. Um, I'm, I, anyway, I'm not going to if you, if you don't see that, I'm not going to try to convince you of it now. But So those are the three ways that ideas associate each, with each other. Because they're because of contiguity in space or t and time, because of resemblance, or because of cause and effect. Um, and then he says, this is on um, page 15, Right. Why should you believe that this division is exhaustive? The more instances we examine and the more care we employ, the more assurance shall we acquire that the enumeration which we form from the whole is complete and entire. Right. So the reason we think that these are the three principles according to which ideas associate with each other and Indeed, I think implicitly the reason we think that ideas always associate with each other according to some principle or other is um, um, whatever it is, it's something that our conviction in increases the more experience we have. And that's exactly what he's going to say in section four, it can never be a characteristic of a rational argument. Um, right, this is on page 23. Now, it seems evident that if this conclusion were formed by reason, it would be as perfect at first and upon one instance as after ever so long a course of experience. This principle is the principle that, the, that, that things will behave in the future the way they already have or something like that. Anyway, what he's saying there is that, you know, it can't be by reason that we conclude that, right? That we conclude that, that this white round thing will be like this previous white round thing. 
It's only after a lot of experience of white round things that look like that that we become more and more convinced that this one also will be cold and will melt at room temperature and will hurt if someone throws it at you, etc. Right? So, uh, whereas he say, says there, if it were a demonstration, a conclusion of reason, then you would only have to do it once and you would be convinced. That's the end of the story. That's not exactly true, and um, uh, we'll see in the treatise he turns the fact that it's not exactly true. In the, in the treatise he turns that into an argument for skepticism also about conclusions of reason, right? Like the fact that if you do a math problem, you're not sure you got it right until you do it again, and maybe again, and have someone else check it, and so forth. But in any case, what here he's saying, and it, it's, it at least seems right on the surface of it, if you have a proof of something, you're done. You don't have to have more experience of it. So, um, so you know, that when in section four, he's going to use that argument to show that certain things we believe about matters of fact couldn't, we couldn't have demonstrated them by reason. But obviously the same thing applies to what he himself said in section three, because he concluded section three by saying more experience will increase our conviction of this fact. So it's, so it's pretty clear that um, what he says about association of ideas in section three is also based on the very empirical principles that he's going to be calling into a question, question in section four. Um, so there's a kind of inconsistency, it appears, in the way he argues in section three and perhaps a kind of question begging in the way he argues in section two. Um, I think uh, that it's not a real inconsistency, or not real question begging, or at least that it's the kind that Hume is going to predict that we can't get out of. Namely, his real conclusion is going to be that um, we can make these arguments to show that we shouldn't believe the results of experience. Um, or at least that we shouldn't presuppose the principle of experience, but nevertheless, we always will believe it and we always will presuppose it. And again, Hume doesn't claim to be exempt from that. Um, on the contrary, whenever he's not writing about this exact topic, he uses cause and effect in his reasoning just like everyone else especially when he's writing about the history of England, where he couldn't get a single sentence without using it. Um, so this again is like, or this is, maybe you can begin to see why now I say that according to Hume, it's really important to know when to argue and when to stop arguing. Um, Okay, so that was everything I wanted to say about impressions and ideas. Are there questions about that before I go on to skepticism about matters of fact? Okay. Um, so, uh, Hume was reputed to be an atheist, but he didn't say he was an atheist. On the other hand, he's, you know, reputed to be a skeptic, and he says that he's a skeptic. Although, he always says that he's a moderate skeptic. Um... Well, maybe not always, but he sometimes says that he's a moderate skeptic. 
Um, so in what sense his skepticism is moderate? We'll have to say more about as we go on. But here is where he's beginning to make his skeptical arguments. And the skeptical argument here is about the kind of skepticism that Barclay was worried about. Skepticism about the existence of the external world. That is, it's not about the kind of skepticism we get at the end of the first meditation where everything has been called into doubt. Um, in, in fact, it's even somewhat narrower than the skepticism that Barclay is, is worried about. So, um, Here we go. This is what the skeptical doubts are about. The nature of that evidence, which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact, beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. So it's, first of all, is skepticism, it's only about matters of fact. That's why I said skepticism about matters of fact. The opposite of matters of fact is, I guess, matters of relations of ideas, or relation of ideas. Um... Hume is not here calling into question the type of knowledge, he says, that we can have based on the relations of ideas. Now, what kind of relations of ideas? How, you know, how can ideas be related to each other such that we can have knowledge about that um, or based on that? So uh, Hume at first doesn't say exactly what kind of relations he has in mind. Remember that Locke had four different ways that ideas can agree or disagree with each other. You might think you could use all of those relations. Um, but later on it becomes clear that um, by relations of ideas, that, or I guess you could say, the knowledge that follows from relations of ideas is um, things whose opposite implies contradiction. Right, so if we look ahead to page 22, part 2 of section 4, um, All reasonings may div be divided into two kinds, namely demonstrative reasoning, or that concerning relations of ideas, and moral reasoning. Now he's using moral here in a broad sense. He doesn't mean ethics necessarily. And moral reasoning, or that concerning matter of fact and existence. That there are no demonstrative evidence in the case, that is, in the case he's just been talking about, seems evident, since it implies no contradiction that the course of nature may change. Right? So the demonstrative argument, which is the same as you can tell here, he's distinguishing between, or no, I mean, he says it concerns relation of ideas, right? So um, the demonstrative argument that concerns relation of ideas is one where if you denied the conclusion, it would imply a contradiction. 
So that's why he's, he's saying, you know, that the course of nature may change can't be the conclusion of a demonstrative argument because I can deny it without contradiction. Do, do people follow what I'm saying here? It's a little bit complicated. The way I'm using the evidence of this text to show something. Right? Like, again, if you just said we form conclusions based on relations of ideas, you might think those relations could be relations of resemblance, cause and effect, who knows what relations between ideas. But, um, but we can tell from here, from this text, that the kind of reasoning based on relations of ideas that he's talking about is the kind where you can't deny the conclusion without contradicting yourself. So that means that the relation of ideas that we're talking about here is basically the relation of identity, or at least partial identity, right? So that these things that we know based on relation ideas are going to be the, the kind of things that Locke calls trifling propositions, right? Like if, you know, yellow is included in the definition of gold, then I can prove that all gold is yellow because to deny it would be imply a contradiction, namely that something yellow is not yellow. That's the kind of thing we're going to be able to show by relations of ideas. Um, however, unlike Locke or Barclay, or it seems like Hume in the treatise, as we'll see, but anyway, definitely unlike, unlike Locke or Barclay, Hume includes mathematics here. So he's not being skeptical, skeptical about mathematics because he says mathematical arguments are based on relations of ideas. So, you know, if that's true, that would mean that somehow denying that the angles, interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles implies a contradiction. Locke denied that, right? Locke said it's not a contradiction, but there's necessary connections between ideas, and that's how we can see it's true, even though there would be no contradiction in denying it. Hume is at least implying pretty strongly here that it would be a contradiction to deny it, although he doesn't explain how. So um, mathematicians actually tried for a long time to find contradictions that would follow from denying Euclid's axioms, um, roughly speaking. Um, but, and so maybe Hume thinks that they've succeeded or will succeed. Uh, in the end, they, they basically failed. And I mean, in fact, well, nothing like this is simple, but Tarski basically showed uh, in the 1930s, I guess, that uh, was able to prove that Euclidean geometry is self-consistent. So you can't show a contradiction, or sorry, you can't show a contradiction from the axioms. But I mean, it was also shown earlier than that, that there's various other non-Euclidean systems that are consistent if Euclidean geometry is. They're either both consistent or both inconsistent. Tarski showed that Euclidean geometry is consistent. Therefore, those other systems are also consistent. Therefore, you can't find a contradiction, for example, the, that example, you know, that, that it's, it's been proved that you can't show a contradiction from the denial of that. Certain assumptions that go into that, there might be more to say about it. But in any case, but Hume obviously didn't know what people would prove in the 19th century, let alone in the 1930s. So um, uh, maybe that's what he thinks. Um, if so, then Kant agrees with Locke. Uh, so that's an interesting point that, that Hume is out of step here. Uh, but okay, so therefore he's not calling mathematics into question. So this skepticism is not about relations of ideas and therefore not about uh, um, mathematics, according to Hume. But it's also not about present... evidence of our senses or memory. 
right? So here, again, we'll see in the treatise, he does, he does raise all kinds of serious problems for this. But here, he's not raising any problems for things like, there's a piece of paper in front of me. How do I know? I see it. Or at least there's something white. Something is affecting me with a white impression. How do I know? I see it. Right? You know, the paper might be more difficult. But um, so, um, and he's also not raising any question about there was something white. How do I know? I remember the impression it caused on me. So basically, he's giving us almost every kind of knowledge that Locke thinks there is. These are also not being doubted. The only thing that's being doubted is matters of fact that go beyond this. So matters of fact about the past that I don't remember. Julius Caesar existed. Matters of fact about the future. Um, tomorrow I will see something white. And matters of fact even about the present beyond the range of my perception, right? There's something white in the next room or whatever. Those are the things that he's going to raise skeptical doubts about. Of course, Locke doesn't think that we have knowledge about most of those things either. Remember, Locke thinks the kind of knowledge we have is very limited and in particular, the kind of knowledge we have about particular things, what actually exists, real existence, that is what Hume is calling here matters of fact. And remember, he actually uses real existence, Locke's phrase, as a synonym for matters of fact. What Locke says we can know about that is only, what we can know about that is only, um, what we know by sensitive knowledge, and it's the same things, right? The things I'm presently seeing or remember, seeing or otherwise sensing. So, right, beyond that, Locke says, well, we have probability. We have principles of correct judgment. We have ways of associating ideas that are reasonable as opposed to mad. Um, in order to come to believe things more strongly or less strongly, but we don't, but reason in the sense of demonstration has nothing to do with that, according to Locke. So, um, so it almost might seem like Hume and Locke, at least so far, don't disagree about anything. However, there is one important thing. So mathematics, Hume includes in relation of ideas, but physics, Mechanistic physics is not about relations of ideas, according to Hume. So, for example, um, you know, uh, that a body that gives me a certain sensation will resist all other bodies moving into its space as long as it remains there. Um, now, that's not, that's not a statement of matter of fact. Right? That's a general proposition. According to Locke, it involves general abstract ideas. Um, Hume sort of agrees with Berkeley. I mean, he says he completely agrees with Berkeley, but they may not mean exactly the same thing. Anyway, but nevertheless, Hume does, just like Berkeley, think that there is something we call stating a general proposition, and that's an example of it. Right? Everybody, everything that gives me that sensation will resist other things moving into its space while it remains there. Um, or no matter how many times you divide it, there will always be, the result of dividing it in two will always be two bodies that also have that property of excluding everything from the space they're in. Right, so those are things that Locke also th believes we know thanks to the necessary connections between distinct ideas of primary qualities. Um, 
Um, so that's something that um, I'm not saying this the right way. According to Locke, it's not a matter, it's about a relation between ideas and it's not a matter of fact. Um, and, and we don't know it from experience. Right? We know it even, as Locke says, even bodies that are too small for us to see, we still know they have this property, or too small for us to feel, perhaps more importantly. We know, we still know they have this property. Um, we don't know that by experiencing them, obviously. How do we know it? We know it as a universal general truth about the relationships between these ideas of solidity and figure and motion and so forth. So, whereas according to Hume, this is going to essentially enter, is going to enter into this. Right? He's going to say, this is just a very general matter of fact. This body does it, this body does it, this body does it. And um, how do we know it? Well, the skeptical doubt is going to show that we don't know it. Okay, is that clear so far? I realize it wasn't as well structured as it could have been. Any questions about that? Okay, so, um, so now I'm going to try to give the basic points that Hume actually makes in his skeptical argument here. So the first one is, um, The belief about, I'm going to call these remote matters of fact. Belief about remote matters of fact, right? That is belief about matters of fact that go beyond what I presently sense or remember having sensed in the past um, are always the result of an inference from effect to cause. So in the case of um, uh, I guess, so in the case of past matters of fact, and to a certain extent of present matters of fact that are beyond the range of my current uh, sensations, but certainly the past ones, you can kind of understand why it's easily, why it's an inference from effect to cause, right? Like what I see is, so, you know, I come into a room and I see that someone, well, I shouldn't say that. I see words written on the blackboard. You know, uh, Fred was here, right? <laughs> so I infer, I don't see Fred. <laughs> Right? But I infer that someone named Fred was in this room in the past. Why? Because I see an effect, the words on the board, which I believe, um, I infer, must have proceeded from that cause. And, you know, I mean, you can already start to see why 
this, according to Locke uh, and Hume, is not going to amount to knowledge because, um, you know, a different cause could have had that effect. Um, but it might be a little bit harder to understand how it is that, um, that beliefs about the future or about the present, the unexperienced present, are also based on, on inferences from effect to cause. You might think they were based on inferences from cause to effect, right? You know, like, um, why do I believe that it's going to rain tomorrow? Well, I see in the satellite view that clouds are moving in, you know, whatever. Assume I'm a good enough meteorologist that I know what kind of clouds those are and so forth. So I see the clouds are moving in. I say, oh, it looks like it might rain tomorrow. Right. So, um, so isn't that an inference from cause to effect? Well, um, I think... Uh, it really still is an inference from effect to cause, according to Hume, and this is the way it works. This is the explanation on page 24. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. What is it that experience actually shows? It only shows us a number of uniform effects resulting from certain objects and teaches us that those particular objects at that particular time were endowed with such powers and forces. When a new object, endowed with similar sensible qualities, is produced, we accept, expect similar powers and forces and look for a like effect. Right, so in the example I was just talking about, this is the way it works. In the past, I experienced a certain kind of cloud and by a certain kind of cloud, I mean a cloud that looked a certain way, let's say, assuming that, you know, that my experience of it was visual. So a cloud that looked a certain way. And I found also that the same cloud that looked that way also had the power to produce rain. Now I see another cloud that looks that way. Why do I think this one will also produce rain? And the answer is, well, so what I gathered from this one is that the object that produces this visible impression in me has a nature such that it contains the power to make rain. Now I see another cloud that, ha that makes the same visible impression on me. I conclude it has the same nature as this cloud. And I know this cloud, the nature of this cloud was such that it had the power to produce rain. So I conclude that this one also has the power to produce rain. So it's an inference from, it's really an inference from effect to cause to effect. Right, that as I take the one effect, which is the impression, the present impression, I know there's a cloud that looks like this because that's part of what we're not doubting. Present matters of right, present matters of present sensation. I'm not doubting. So I know there's a cloud that looks like this. But the question is, how do I know that that, that cloud also might produce rain? And the reason is because I assume that whatever the the you know, so like to fill in what this nature is, I mean, like ultimately I think Hume thinks that we can't really fill it in, but at this stage, think about it the way Locke thinks about it. So think of this nature as the arrangement, the bulk texture and figure of its minute parts. So, you know, we think uh, the reason it pr produced that visual impression on me is because it has a certain bulk figure and texture and motion of minute parts. And that same bulk figure, texture, etc., of minute parts also gave it the power to produce rain. 
Now I see the same visual impression. I think to myself, oh, that cloud must also have that bulk figure and texture of minute parts that this one did. And since in this one it gave the power to make rain, in the other one it must also give the power to make rain. So, right, so our belief about what the cloud, what the new cloud is going to do in the future is based on an inference from the effect which is the visual impression to the cause which is the inner nature of the cloud right the bulk figure and texture and motion of its minute parts and then back to a future effect the rain. So the second step on page 16. Mm -hmm. And here it is constantly supposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which is inferred from it. Right? So in order to make these, to form these beliefs about um, remote matters of fact, I have to presuppose that there's a connection between this effect, the visual impression, and the nature that's inferred from it. But then the third step is, on page 17, um, that this type of uh, connection is only discovered by experience. I shall venture to affirm as a general proposition which admits of no exception that the knowledge of this relation is not in any instance attained by reasonings a priori but arises entirely from experience. So the only way we know what kind of nature can produce this effect is by experience. Now, if you say what kind of nature, well, for example, the one that also produces rain. Right? So we the only reason we know that the thing that produces this visual impression is the same thing that also produces rain is because we actually experience something doing both. We can never figure that out, that kind of connection without experience. Why can we never figure out that kind of connection without experience? Um, well, I mean, basically, the reason is the same reason that Locke and Barclay would give for this. No object ever discovers by the qualities which appear to the senses either the causes which produce it or the effects which will arise from it. The question is, so I think both Locke and Berkeley will agree with that only for different reasons and to begin with it's not clear which is Hume's reason. So, um, so Locke will say that that's true because our senses aren't good enough to see this 
bulk figure texture and motion of the minute parts or otherwise sense them feel them i guess would be the best way so our senses are not good enough to to you know discern these primary qualities um so um uh the quality we're going from is always um um or at least except in very few cases is always something whose connection to which which doesn't directly reveal the nature that it follows from so when we see something have this visual effect and produce rain we don't know what the nature of that thing actually was that allowed it to do that but if we had better senses we we would know that right so that's Locke's reason as opposed to Barclay's reason which is that um, ideas cannot resemble anything active or any power so that's um, right so that just says that you know whatever the thing and of course according to Barclay the thing that caused both these effects is the divine will it's not some texture of parts and uh, of minute parts um, Barclay is saying that you know when we see these two ideas together nothing about seeing them together can resemble the power that caused them both because as I was arguing before when I talked about Barclay he thinks that you know no relationship between inert things can be necessary that is can resemble the way something forces something else to happen something has power over something else um There's only two minutes left. So I'll just say, um, I think, however, when you look into it more carefully, it becomes clear that Hume's reason is really um, Barclay's reason, not Locke's. Um, that is, Bar Hume thinks there can never be a, ne a visible necessary connection between different effects and can never be in the sense that this is a matter of relations of ideas. That is, I think Hume agrees with Barclay that it's absurd. It's a contradiction. There can't be things that are merely effects that also one necessitates the other. So if there is such thing as necessity or as real rationalist explanation where you can't think the effect except by thinking the cause, um, then if there is, then Hume is going to agree with Berkeley that at least that's not a relationship between our ideas ever. So... Um, Therefore, we can never just by looking at the ideas predict that they'll go to what that they'll go together and be produced by the same thing. The only way we can find out is by observing that they actually are produced by the same thing. Oops. Okay, I'm out of time. So I just say, so I mean, first of all, this, this is where you can see that Hume is going to, is the case that Hume is going to deny we have knowledge where Locke says we do is the case of where Locke thinks there are visible necessary connections between distinct ideas. That is the case of physics, right? Like it's the case of um, the effects of solidity the fact that bodies can push each other and so forth. Um, and um, the other thing, but I, I think I'll go into this more at the beginning next time, that um, the, the final step of the argument is 
that um, when I realized I didn't write down the other two steps. Oops. Anyway, the, f the final fourth step of the argument is, um, but when we say that it's discovered by experience, that we learned from experience that these two things go together, we're not giving a reason to believe they go together. So, right, so the conclusion is that in none of these cases do we have a demonstration of the result. Um, all right, I will have to say more about that next time. Um, and also about how this agrees or doesn't agree with Locke. And I will see you then.